welcome to Useful Idiots. Uh, this is our first post-inauguration uh, recording. and it's a, it's a special show. Special show for a special day and a special time. Uh, racism and imperialism are over. It's all over. The world is back. Actually, it's it's now advanced to, to a state of pure awesomeness. Yeah, and, and uh, awesomeness and enlightenment. and enlightenment. And who else would we want to talk about this with than the most enlightened person who will ever talk to us, and that's, of course, Thomas Frank. Thomas Frank, who's going to join us the whole show. Welcome, Tom. Yeah, I'm glad to be here and spread my enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're basking. That's what this is. This is, a, this is a collective basking. We're recording after the inauguration, so we're, we're in the middle of... Uh, a, a, a feeling of great joy among the land. Tom, what was your warmth? The warmth is just sort of you know percolating through our bodies. The, uh, so okay, first of all is relief. So I don't. I will confess, I was just so relieved when I woke up this morning and the world was still and the world was still turning and uh, uh, Donald Trump's helicopter was on its way out of D.C. I was that was that made me pretty happy. Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, Biden stepped up and gave his dreadful speech and it was dreadful. It it was, was, OK, so, 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 so let's get into the dreadfulness. It was dreadful. It, that's my, my opinion. But it was it, but it was the thing is, what flavor of dreadful? OK, right. uh, most inaugural speeches are are pretty bad. And we should also tell trade stories about, I've been to a bunch of these inaugurals. Uh-huh, yeah. Which ones did you go to? So I went to Trump's and I went to Obama's, but I didn't, I actually didn't go to the mall that day. It was too crowded. I went the day before. Ah. Uh, and uh, uh, and yeah. I remember the first one I ever watched was Jimmy Carter in sixth, I was in sixth grade and we wow. all, they pulled us all out of class and we all sat in front of a big TV and watched I'll, and I will tell you, I was, what was I, 10, 11? And uh, I really admired him. I mean, it, when you're that age, you know, and he seemed like such a good guy compared to Nixon and all yeah, that. Yeah, he is, that. wasn't he? Well, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, as before, before you got on, Katie, we were talking about Christopher Lash. And Carter actually, like, called Lash into, I, I don't know the whole story. Carter had a conversation with Lash. And out of that conversation came his worst speech, which was the famous malaise. Oh, he wrote that. Lash, so historian well, Lash Christopher Lash influence. inspired the, the malaise speech. That's yes, interesting. that's right. And and wow. I saw so I watched that and I remember exactly where I was when I watched it. I was in, you know, the, the my, my parents bedroom in our suburban home in Prairie Village, Kansas. And I and I thought Jimmy Carter was so great. We had this philosopher president. Um, he was so smart. And then, like, it took several days for the media to decide this was the worst speech of all time. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my initial reaction was that this guy is fantastic. But, uh, um, yeah. So I how does that compare with, with, with today, though? I'm trying to remember what Carter actually said in his inaugural. Well, so he was trying to be honest about, what, like, all the different things that were e empty about American life. And yes, but there were echoes of Carter in in Biden's speech. You know, we you are we are a good people. You know, uh, we all need to come together. We need to end this period of what did he call it? An uncivil war. Right. That was all very Carter esque. Now, maybe you guys thought it, Biden's speech was excellent. I just thought it was like anodyne and like uh, uh, it was sort of like a dial survey speech where they just kind of threw a bunch of. Uh, cliches and connective yeah, tissue yeah. out was, there. Exactly, exactly. It was just. I have no I rem memory whatsoever what was said. I've read it three times and I'm having trouble remembering it. Yeah. It's, and, and and anodyne is exactly right. I mean, it is exactly. It's just one cliche after another. And uh, you know, the, he had that long quotation that he said was from a song. I looked. I looked it up. It's from a, a song that, yes, it's the theme song of a Ken Burns special. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Ken, Burns, Ken Burns. Well, he, he, he said it was a quote. He just didn't give he didn't give the source. But it's from a Ken Burns special about World War Two, a Ken Burns series. And uh, he also echoed really strongly a very Ken Burns Esque historian, which is John Meacham, all that crap about the better, better angels. Wait, better Meacham angels of our nature. the Biden person who yeah. was working for Biden and didn't yeah. tell MSNBC. Yes. Well, yeah, but that's like Biden has been echoing him all through the whole campaign. I mean, that's that's but but this this is this is a master of cliches that we're talking about here. You know, the the the, the cliche ideas, cliche expressions. Yes, yeah. so everything. Yeah. So I, I I thought of a funny way to to talk about this, if you guys will allow me, which is um, 
uh, I was looking up exactly a hundred years ago uh, on a different inaugural yeah. inauguration day. L- Warren let's, try, let's try to guess what what writer could be talking about what presidential <laughs> inauguration. <laughs> oh come right. on, I I have to tell you who. No, okay. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it, and then you can okay. guess. But right. I already said he's talking about he's talking about Warren G. Harding. And this is what the journalist said exactly 100 years ago. He said, setting aside a college professor or two and a half dozen dipsomaniacal newspaper reporters, he takes the first place in my Valhalla of literati. (laughs) He's talking about Harding. He's first place in my Valhalla. That is to say, he writes the worst English I have ever encountered. <laughs> it re- wait, wow. wait, it gets better. It reminds me of a string of wet sponges. It, <laughs> it reminds me of tattered washing on the line. It reminds me of stale bean soup, of college yells, of dogs barking idiotically through endless nights. This is the best. Wait, it gets better. It is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. It drags itself out of the dark abysm of pish and crawls <laughs> insanely up to the topmost pinnacle of posh. It is rumble and bumble. It is flap and doodle. It is balder and dash. Dash. <laughs> wow. That's a... Uh, that's, uh, I, think, I think we all know what writer that is. <laughs> that's H.L. Mencken, my hero. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't Warren go for... Harding. Isn't that what, funny? That's 100 years ago now. Where was the Bosch and Bunkum? I'm kind of, I'm kind of a, a little... little uh... I'm only reading part of the essay. It goes oh, on, and on, okay. on and on, right. like trying to describe the, the idiocy of this. So, so Harding would misread words. Uh, famous. Uh-huh. The famous one is, is the word was normality, and he read it as normalcy. Uh-huh. And it, and, but there are a whole bunch of them like that. And, uh, and and Mencken just thought this was hilarious. Can you explain who Mencken is for listeners? Oh, viewers? I'm sorry. I, I should have said H.L. Mencken. Yes, he was the great the great uh, journalist of, of that era, of the uh, teens and the 20s. Wrote many, many, many books, edited the American Mercury. And I, when, I was a, when I was younger, I used to try to imitate his style. But this is a guy who is a real misanthrope. He didn't like anybody. He did, it didn't stop with Warren G. Harding. He didn't like Wilson either. He didn't like Coolidge. He, he hated Roosevelt. He hated everyone. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, he's kind of my hero, actually. Yeah, I wonder what Mencken would have said about today. It would have been... Oh, would my God. Well, the, the thing is, that there, there's nothing like that is permitted. So right. in, in, in like... Right. English English journalism that you still encounter that kind of attitude that just like over the top swaggering insult, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. but you uh, you just don't see that in America, especially about an inaugural address. (laughs) You know, we're all supposed to be unless it's coming from the other side. Right. But people were people were incredibly harsh about Trump's. And uh, I saw. Yeah. uh, Do you want to hear my Trump inaugural story? Yeah. So I go down there for, on that day and, uh, you know, you're, 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 the idea in D.C. is you're just supposed to be able to walk out onto the mall. You weren't able to do that this time. Nobody. Did you see there was nobody there this time? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and uh, and I and, and I got down to the mall and there were all of these security. This is for Trump's inaugural. There were all kinds of security measures in place. And so you had to go through the, all this shit. And so yeah. I, I, get, I get down there and I'm standing in line, but you can clearly hear Trump's voice through these megaphones, these loudspeakers all over the National Mall. And uh, I'm standing in line to 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 let me out onto the mall. And there's all these Trump supporters around me. And I swear to God, it started raining with his very first syllables. So like (laughs) speaking and it started raining at the exact same moment. And I made some remark like, um, you know, what about how about that? It started raining. And the woman in front of me said, it's it's it's. Jesus's tears, and then, <laughs> and then she clarified. She said, "They're tears of joy." <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Not sad tears, happy tears. Yeah. Right, right. Jesus is happy. He's so happy that Trump's president that he's like weeping. <laughs> and uh, and I actually, you know, Trump got really hammered for that speech. Do you remember American Carnage? Mm-hmm. But it, I thought there was something I didn't think it was a good speech, but I thought there was something um, really interesting about it. He talked about deindustrialization. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. He said like talking about factories standing like tombstones. Mm-hmm. It, it was this kind of a good image. 
I'm sure Steve Bannon wrote it, you know, but yeah. Uh, yeah. it reminded me of when I was writing Listen Liberal, I went to this town called Fall River, Massachusetts, where they have um, these. I, I grew up not like five miles. From oh, well, you know what I'm talking about then? Those yeah. mills, you know, those mm. mills. And they're, they're, they're all over the city landscape and they're completely vacant from top to bottom. Mm. And they look they do look like tombstones over the city. And that was exactly the image mm. that I thought of. And so I kind of thought that was I kind of thought that was uh like well, sort of okay, <laughs> yeah. Because his his uh, his convention speech was basically like a worse version of Nixon's silent majority, like Law and Order thing, and yeah. they they reconfigured it to be this quasi populist uh, yeah. concept about crumbling America, and it was re- it was really dark and apocalyptic, yes. right? But, like, but, but we, I think we needed that. I mean, he turned out to be like he turned out to. I mean. He did nothing about any of it. I mean, he just turned of out course. to be the, big, the biggest charlatan right. who ever sat in the Oval Office. We should also right. debate that, like, how bad is he, you know? Right. Well, well what, yeah, we have for, for Biden, we rate things by golden leg hairs. Um, <laughs> what could we do for Trump? How many golden? What could that be? How many? Uh, how many scalp reductions? That's three scalp <laughs> reductions. Yeah. Way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, okay, but this is an important question because we go, we got we got to get to this. So obviously we had we had the Capitol riot, and I, I know that you've been writing some stuff on this theme of how exactly uh, productive was this last four years of just kind of relentless, the sort of anti-Trump propaganda that came from a unified front yeah. of basically elite culture in the, in this country so that's right a, so that's so you're we're changing the subject from trump to anti-trump which is fine with right. me mm-hmm. yeah uh, but but uh, uh but at some point we got to go back and and uh and and think how how bad a president was he and it is it is fascinating that he saved the very last the very worst thing for last you know the storm absolutely storming of the capital you know what the hell yeah you know the, it, unleashing his followers on on his own vice president like what the well, I, 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 can't, I still can't get declining. my head around that one, you know? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to pause this really good oh, chat. You get it? Pause? I know it's really rough out here for a lot of people, but I wanted to give Matt the chance to talk about something. Well, I mean, Katie, has your pet helped you through the pandemic this year? So much. She's really cute. So I cuddle with her. Um, mm. She's very amusing. I bring her on my shows. She was on Useful Idiots last week. Look, from the beginning of the pandemic, PetSmart has been an essential retailer, making sure that you can get everything your pet needs. And right when you need it, they have 1,600 convenient locations. And they lead the pack with safe and easy ways to shop while we're doing canine metaphors Funds. uh look yeah. they're cleaning and disinfecting products they follow the cdc recommendations everybody wears face coverings or masks they're required for employees and for pet parents there are decals on the floor and signage and new protocols that reinforce social distancing requirements so if you've been if you've had a catastrophic brain injury and you don't remember cat- where you are catastrophic catastrophic cat- cat- catastrophic and you're and you're stumbling around and you don't know what you're doing, and you look down dog the floor, the floor, doggone it, is going to remind you to socially distance at, uh, at PetSmart. And they've got uh, plexiglass shields in place at the registers uh, and also at the salon and pets hotel lobbies. Uh, they got stores and grooming salons where they offer digital check-in, curbside drop-off and pickup and contactless payment. You don't have to have any real co- contact with a human being when you go into this place. So, you know, PetSmart, you know, look, it's responded to the unprecedented demand for contactless shopping by adding curbside pickup for website and app orders. And now, now, Katie. Yeah, Matt. It's offering free same day delivery powered by DoorDash through January 31st, 2021. So you can get everything your pet needs right to your door and right when you need it. PetSmart associates really love pets, love caring for them. And that's a big part of why they work there. Uh, and they're as an essential retailer since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, they've made it safe and easy for you to do care for your pet too, online or in stores. At PetSmart, the health and safety of employees, pet parents, and pets is what's most important, which is why they require face coverings, support social distancing, and have installed plexiglass shields and enhanced cleaning to follow CDC recommendations. 
Or if you're interested in contactless shopping, just order online on PetSmart.com or in the PetSmart app and enjoy free, easy uh, curbside pickup uh, or free same-day delivery. Again, powered by DoorDash. We've, we've mentioned that twice, but it deserves to be mentioned twice, don't you think? It does. We can't uh, dash over it. Right. Through January 31st, uh, so you can get everything your pet needs right to your door and right when you need it. So check out PetSmart.com for more details. Actually, just go there recreationally. Just go check it out. Right? It's better than other things you could be surfing for. All right. That pause was long enough. Let's go back to Tom. We switched over today. Like We had like a formal switch over from like media nonstop media rage to nonstop media sycophancy, right? Yes, and, yes. And it, it was... Oh, it God. was kind of amazing, like to watch. Like Chris Wallace was like on near tears and saying that this was the greatest inaugural dress that I've ever heard. Here's a quote from a Washington Post guy: Joe and Bo used to watch an eagle soar by the dock. Now, when Biden steps to the to a lectern, he will be greeted by a presidential seal. It features as its most prom- prominent symbol a bald wait, wait, eagle. Wait, 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 an eagle. Yes, yes, I got yes. it. And there was the thing last night where the guy on uh, uh, oh CNN was talking about how the lights uh, at the lighting up the mall were like Joe Biden's arms wrapped around America. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's like their political director or something. John, John King saying there's an air of cleansing about today. So, OK, like for most people, it's just like, Ew, all right, whatever. But I think you know, for half the country, this is like it's probably going to work on their psyches in a very specific way. And I know you've been interested in this. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that, Tom, because you, you have very particular ideas about how how yeah. all that went so over. It's, 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 so I'm f- look and this is uh, I'm going to say we we should also talk at some point about how what we thought when Trump came in and how our minds have been changed. But I um, almost immediately, once Trump got elected, uh, became fascinated by um, anti, you know, Trumpism is fascinating, but anti-Trumpism is also really goddamn interesting. And the way that people would uh, sort of um, almost instantly, you know, ramped it up to 10, you know, went to this kind of hysteria uh, you know, the, the, uh, the what was the term that I used? A gastitude, the uh, mm-hmm. this constant mm-hmm. air, the, the, you know, constant wailing uh, that's been going on now for four years uh, everywhere that you turn. And uh, that is, I think, just as fascinating as Trump. And it's going to outlast Trump. This is now with, Trump is mm-hmm. gone and the uh, gastitude is still with us. And w- I mean, we're in a we're in a brand new media climate. Uh, you know, a brand new cultural climate. Let's let's go ahead and just uh, go all the way here. A brand new cultural climate that that I think is is totally unprecedented in American life where you've got this. Well, unprecedented in our lives. None of us remember the 1950s, but there is an absolute consensus an like airtight consensus among cultural elites in this country of a kind that we have never seen in our lives, in our lives. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, uh, and it's it, it is just it's an amazing thing to behold. It's also really none of us are part of it. We're all outside of that consensus. Mm-hmm. And so we're, you know, looking looking from the outside in. But this what I what I call it is a consensus of, you know, of the aghast. And uh, uh, I don't know how they're going to you know process the next four years, but we're in a really strange time in America where it's not just this that, that they've come together in a kind of airtight consensus where if you want to write, we're journalists here. If you want to write for a you know one of the, one of these the sort of mainstream publications in America, you basically you have to accept this their party line. There's just there's no other way. If you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, whatever you are, you have to be you have to share these certain you know preconceptions of agastitude. And um, one of the things that sort of made it okay and made it kind of fun is that it was an opposition. It was a right. consensus of opposition. Right. But now it isn't. Now it is fully in charge. And uh, it's not just, you know, um, a coming together of elites uh, against the president. It's a coming together of elites with or, the president. Yeah. yeah. And that is, uh, we are entering a new world and there's also, I mean, we can talk about all the different elements of this, uh, you know, what it includes, what it doesn't include. The, the aspect of it that blows my mind 
is that, well, there's many aspects of it that blow my mind. The first one is that it includes the intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, what mm -hmm. the hell? Like, since when have they been part of the, like, the liberal consensus? That's just too, almost too strange, you know? I, and, uh, you know, but I don't know how- they've been part of it for a while, except they haven't been- They were, they like, were part of it back in the 50s. Optics-wise? I, I certainly wouldn't think so. I mean, I've been a liberal all my adult life, and, and I never regarded the intelligence agencies as allies oh, you, or friends. You you're know? not, you're talking about liberals. I thought you meant Democrat presidents. You're talking about the, 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 the civilians, the non-presidents, no, no, non yeah, Democratic presidents, you know, that's, that's a different, you know, that's certainly right, a different right. ballgame. Uh, uh, culturally, that whole security state thing was never part of, like, right. the... You know, like the liberal intellectual elite, but now they're like fu fused in a way that it's, it's like it's like it's very weird, right? Yeah, and very well, healthy. They're all commentate. All these former guys are you know commentators on the CNN, yeah, yeah. etc. And uh, uh, and you've also got you know the situation where monop where you've got monopolies, cultural monopolies emerging all over the place. By the way, did I ever show you guys this when I was? Doing when I was doing the baffler, does this, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, I was doing no, the baff the baffler magazine back in the day. Mm -hmm. Commodifiers at the new gilded age, and the the big idea that we were all writing about at, at the baffler was the idea of the culture trust, the idea huh. of you know that, that 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 culture had come under a kind of monopoly control, which in the nineties that was not you know that was uh, kind of an exaggeration. Today, right, it's true. Uh, I mean, there's the, there's the newspaper industry. It's basically three papers, and the Wall Street Journal doesn't really count because their online presence is extremely limited. Right. But, you know, the New it's York Times, the Washington Post. You know, that is it, and they increasingly resemble each other. Yeah. Well, the whole the whole kind of left liberal media landscape, which was pretty fragmented and pretty representative of lots of different sects, um, even five years ago. It's almost exactly uh, to tonally all the same now. It's it doesn't been, matter. It's, 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 you'd say it's been cornered. Yeah, and they've 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 rolled it up. Yeah, it's, it's it it behaves like a monopoly, and then you also have real monopolies. You know, Facebook, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, what Google? You know, real monopolies out there. You know, astride the culture and. People are just finally now starting to understand the danger that this represents. And one of the things that has been most shameful, I think, about the Trump years, we're talking about anti-Trumpists here during the Trump years, is their constant soliciting of these cultural monopolies, to soliciting them to crack down on their uh, on their rivals, on the you know on 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 people they disagree with. Yeah, I, I, it, this is like crazy i mean it's 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 cold war behavior you know this is like this is it's it's not quite mccarthy but we're getting there you know mccarthy was a, McCarthy blowhard and, a blowhard and an asshole but if you go back and read the you know about the culture war it's uh, sorry the cold war climate and ignore mccarthy and look at all the other stuff that was going on in america back then it was scary and we are heading right towards it again right now is what i feel that's the way i think about it well like look at the way matt is totally marginalized uh and glenn greenwald and uh you know other people max blumenthal aaron mate uh ronnie Callick, all these people who uh if if they're retweeted by a politician you have people swarming the politician and urging them not to to retweet them um yeah that's just in the world of twitter but people are right. totally tainted i mean there really is this really lazy labeling of someone's being tainted or toxic and there's no evidence required and people are just written off yeah taint because they're communists <laughs> right yeah exactly well it's now a... <laughs> now they're not communists they're putinists Right. So they, they signed on to one of these these front groups. The Communist Party used to set up these front groups and they would lure people in because right. the front groups that they'd have really attra attractive names. Right. You know, they'd be like, we're doing good things in the world. And so well-meaning yeah. people would sign up. And then 20 years later, some asshole would find um, that they had attended a meeting. Right. And then and then they'd, they'd get fired. They would get well canceled. Yeah. They'd lose they'd lose their job, you know.
the John and, Reed Society. My uncle, great well, uncle. That one was. That, it that was one. pretty easy to see that that one was. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Communist. Not that a covert, right? But there were there right, were a right, lot. They, but they had they had a lot of them. You know, they were and and some of them were like totally anodyne. You know. Um, you know, they had like dance clubs and music clubs, right. and, you know. So what's going to happen going going forward, though, because I always thought that one of the one of the strategies of the Trump years, like from a propaganda standpoint, was like it, it was implied that you couldn't have a slow news day because that was logistically impossible. He, it, it had to be an emergency. There was no such thing as a day where something wasn't terribly wrong, because as long as he was in the White House, it, ha it yeah. had to be. So we had this like never ending string of like manias and panics about different things. And then, of course, there, there was a real one at the end. But what are that they has to continue, Matt? That's the pro so now you so you're an expert on on the journalism as industry. And right. That has to continue. Now, here's the question. How are they going to how well, is it right. going to continue? How are they going to how are they going to sustain the emergency going forward or will they like I mean they've got to can you are the, what are we all going to go back to the you know to the 90s right uh, so uh, I I've been doing a lot of looking back at my older work recently and it's funny how the different the climate is now so my first book was about the um the dot com bubble and it was well uh, that uh, putting that one aside that was like an academic book but my first commercial book was called one market under god and it was about the dot com bubble and this period of euphoria in the 90s which was exactly the opposite of the trump years you know in the trump years everything was disaster a gastitude constantly disasters right around the corner and in the 90s it was the it's like hey millionairehood is right around the corner right right <laughs> do the right thing and oh my god look what happened you just made 800 percent in a single day <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I used to subscribe to fortune magazine i would have cnbc on all the time to get that flavor into my writing this like incredible euphoria you know and i would subscribed to fortune magazine and each issue was like 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 three or four hundred pages long because it was so thick with advertising you know, oh my like, god oh, yeah my that's god. right all the magazines were like that they're you know they were just <laughs> yeah and, and journalism you know these people made a good living <laughs> writing for writing for magazines like that back then you know but it was it was absolutely the complete opposite and i wonder i mean can can we shift gears? Can we go back to like nonstop euphoria? Can you go from hysteria to euphoria? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, how are they going to do it? Because the. But I agree with you. I think the model now requires hysteria and requires hate. Right. Uh, and uh, and I don't know. How, I, I don't know where they're gonna where they're gonna get that from. But I, it's actually not hard to. I mean, as we've all seen from Twitter, as we've all learned from Twitter, it's not hard to make a you know, a, a tiny misstep or a verbal gaffe into a, you know, a problem for the ages. We've all right. seen this. We've all seen this happen to people. Right. And right. Uh, well, was this, how similar was this to going from Bush to Obama? Good question. Good question. Well, it was. Bush was, Bush was really hated towards the end. Remember? He, he, yeah. He was. And, and also remember Obama was elected in part because of there was this uh, euphoric feeling among other things about like a dismantling of the war on terror right and the en the end of all of these stress inducing adventures in the middle east et cetera. Et cetera. Right. But, but most importantly obama came into office in the middle of the financial crisis I mean, as of, it, yeah. was, it was still unfolding when he became president and people thought and bush had been very trump like and he, you know trump dealing with coronavirus the way he dealt with it is like to do nothing right, right. i mean it's like zero leadership <laughs> and that was bush on the financial crisis he just washed his hands of it he had no idea what to do uh right. you know he turned it all over to hank paulson do you remember that guy <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole sending a letter to Congress. I, I need I need eight hundred million dollars in three minutes. Yeah, exactly. He's the one then, who, knelt, then, who knelt in front of Nancy Pelosi, right? Yes, he did. And uh, and he uh, and 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 the remember and the Fed bailed out AIG all on their own. They didn't ask anybody's permission. They just did it. That's right. Oh my. That's God. right. And yeah, then Obama. Ob and so Obama coming in, it did feel like. Um, like we, you know, we had Obama was so, you know, palpably a better man than Bush, you know, <laughs> it's just like better, superior in every way. And I it, well, that's what I thought at the time anyways. And I thought that, you know, 
this guy is going to he's going to you know swing into action and right. he's going to you know he's going to pull a Franklin Roosevelt and it's going to be great and I was certainly optimistic. At yeah, that point. I was too. Absolutely. I was too, yeah. Yeah. But there is a bit of a difference also in that Obama was seen as really unprecedented, right? So it wasn't he was a re, he wasn't seen as a return to normal, whereas Biden obviously is seen as a return to normal because he's older and because he's uh, white and because he's been vice president because he's been a senator That's right. for so long. That's right. Do you want me to? I, I can make that even uh, when you say that about Obama. One of the reasons I supported him is because I thought he would root out the uh, influence of Clintonism in the Democratic Party. I ser- yeah. I sincerely believed that. I'm so- almost ashamed to admit it. Now. I bought that too. But it took a couple of years Jeremiah before we understood Wright. that it was just it was just the same. It was the same right. crap, you know. And, and, and the thing also, that made me like him was that was after they went after Jeremiah Wright. Remember that? I sure did. Mm-hmm. With yeah. Hillary Clinton, and they went after his Bill pastor. Ayers. That's when I, they started I, like. There's another guy I knew. Uh, Bill Ayers was a friend of mine. Oh yeah, really? He, he, yeah, he went. And, he sent uh, his kids to the summer camp I went to. Oh really? So I knew his kids quite well. Uh, he he was. Uh, it's funny the 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 shit that he got the in those days uh, because he's a, in person. He's just the nicest guy in the world, Bill Ayers. Yeah, and he was always just uh, super helpful when I was doing the Baffler magazine. He was the, just the best guy around. And I uh, when all this shit happened to him, I wrote about this. For the Wall Street Journal, isn't that funny? I wrote an I wrote an op ed for the Wall Street Journal called "My Friend is- Bill Ayers." <laughs> I know the terrorist. That's clickbait. <laughs> no, it was real. It was real. I mean, he really was my friend, and it was it was while all this while all this crap was happening. It was in that summer of two thousand and eight. You know, and <laughs> okay. Well, there's another question we got we got to ask ourselves, which is. A, well, Tom, we didn't get a chance to talk to you about this. How do you feel about the Capitol right? And B, you know, they're they're talking about some pretty intense responses, like a domestic terrorism bill, which the squad opposed last night. Yeah. But if that goes through, like, you know, do, like what what's the likelihood that we're going to go enter this domestic war on terror period, which, you know, just, I feel like there's a non-zero like- chance that, that that will happen. You know? That seems like such a bad idea to me. Right. Uh, I mean, the thing is that is, do we need a new bunch of laws? Everything those guys no. did was al- is already illegal. You know, you're right, already not al- you're already not allowed to storm yeah. the Capitol. And and uh, you know what else is is creepy is I, as far as I'm concerned, those Capitol police have no. Ex- I mean, we haven't done any hearings yet. There haven't been any press conferences yet. Yeah. There probably won't ever be. But like, how did they not know that was that was going to happen? I, I still don't understand that. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to have some clarity about who whose orders those were to yeah. stand down and all that. But um, but, you know, they're, they're, I think one of the things they're talking about in the FBI is already there have been stories about how they were limited in their ability to surveil, to con- conduct surveillance on some of these people because you know that they didn't there isn't a designation that they could have used that would have allowed them to get a warrant or something like that Uh, i I, so i i a strongly doubt that and b this is this is just you know that you know how dangerous this is i mean of course domestic spying this is we've been down this road before and i just want to say you were i'm pretty liberal for liberals to encourage this or be in favor of this is yeah, you okay. are selling the whirlwind, my friends. This is the this is the yeah. worst idea imaginable. It it's always gonna always gonna come back to uh, uh, at the left. Yeah. You go you look back through American history at who has been surveilled, who's been uh, deplatformed, who's been had their lives ruined, and it's always people on the left. Uh, and we're not just talking about the fifties here. If you go back to the nineteen twenties, you know when they they were thrown guys in the IWW in jail. They were deporting people, right. uh, you know, for their political views. Yeah, the bomber raids. Um, not right wingers. Now they were deporting leftists for their political views. And same these same are, thing after World War. Uh, Roosevelt did it in 1942, right? Social. Well, that was that was uh, fascists. That was, no, was uh, that the uh, the famous. They they put a bunch of fascist leaders on trial. Um, they did, and anti semites. But they also did socialist worker parties. That that was the first set of. I did that. I did not know. Sedition trials, but uh, 
but yeah, no, but then, you know, then we had the domestic surveillance. Remember that whole Cy Hirsch story that came out in 75 and mm -hmm. it was like sort of decided by all the newspapers that, you know what, we're not going to do this. We're not going to follow up on this story that much. And and that just. But that's a, that's one of the biggest, you know, scandals of all time that you talk about the COINTELPRO stuff here. Well, that came out. That's the stuff that came out. Yeah, right. The, the, the stuff that came out around the time of the Pike Church. Yeah, I, ju I can't believe we'd go back down that that path again. I mean, th look, there's already laws in place. We need to, you know, they, we yeah. need to it, it, see what went wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then and then we can talk about what what needs to be changed. But the idea of, of like unleashing domestic spying, this is a terrible this is a terrible idea. You know, it's and funny. It seems like it's for the first time. I mean, I. This has been sometimes liberals have ignored this as a as a threat a lot, but usually leftists. And that's a whole what does that mean? But I think we all know somewhat what I'm talking about. But this is the first time when actual I think there's so many lefties who are who think that this is a good idea. And I've heard this. There's this weird argument, which is that if you say it's going to bite us in the ass um, more than anyone else, they go, well, they're already doing that to us. So who cares? Let's do it to what the does right that mean? now. They're already. what? So that's a uh, you it know, that's. The, they're already incredibly, 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 ir us. incredibly irresponsible, uh, you know, for yeah, these people to think that this is a and it what what where it comes from is, you know, we were talking earlier about the coalition of the aghast and this right. kind of consensus, this, this airtight consensus among elites. And I want to come back to that in a minute. But there is I mean, this consensus is especially strong in a place like academia. And but I'm talking people, about more radical leftists who aren't in academia. But anyway, so that we can, that's a whole other thing. OK, the, but these people believe that they that their control over cultural legitimacy, that their grip over cultural legitimacy is never going to end. And I am here to tell you they are so utterly mistaken. <laughs> they are so <laughs> utterly mistaken. I want to talk about this. Uh, this. Uh, wait, I want to one funny story and then we'll talk about the coalition of the aghast again. Mm -hmm. And the funny story is this. So I, when I was younger, I used to be a punk rocker. And uh, did you, what, what instrument did you play? No, no. I mean, like I was a fan. Oh, you know? I see. And, I, and my, the instrument was a turntable. And I, and I had a show <laughs> on the college radio station and I would, you know. Nice. And um, there was a, and everybody's throwing around this word sedition. And I'm like, huh, sedition. That was the name of Malcolm McLaren's shop on the King's Road in, in London. It was, was it really? Seditionaries. Yeah, because we, look at our commercial culture. And this is the whole conflict that nobody ever thinks about. Our commercial, commercial culture is in love with extreme. They use this word extreme all the time to sell everything, you know? Right. Extreme Cadillacs, extreme soda pop. You know, it, this is, I used sports. to write about this all. Yeah. I, I used yeah. to write about this all the time. It's it's like, uh, you know, they, it, so we have one part of our culture that's like, we got to crack down on extremism. We got to have a war on extremism. The other part of our culture is like, extreme? When you're really <laughs> extreme? Yeah. <You> know? <laughs> it's, it's like, what the fuck? Who I are know. we? Who are we? And then Joe Biden quotes from a song in a Ken Burns, you know, a Ken Burns. <laughs> so terrible. Did you? Did everyone see the? the, uh, we, all need the to be, we all need to like live life as though we're in a Ken Burns documentary, you know. Then it'll all make sense. Well, that but would be good because that would never end at that point. That would that would that would, that would solve the eternal life right. question, you know. <laughs> but Tom, I just do think it's worth noting that there is there's another group of people who are not the typical like usual suspects who really see themselves as more radical and who are not who like agree with the left uh, with us on a lot of things, and even they are for it in a, in a way that's new you know what i'm talking about matt Does yeah absolutely yeah, yeah so no, and, and left it left us who are in favor of censorship let's say yes really? right who again it's not because they trust the elites or the institutions or have any kind of cultural capital or cachet or buy-in it's because they just think that it's like these are hateful white supremacists and they need to be deplatformed. It's that kind yeah, well, of that, look, there's a, that uh, they need to be yeah. thrown in jail is what needs to happen. They still, they broke into the Capitol. Well, the ones who commit they, crimes. But the problem is that they're one. Who, yeah. But this is not that's not what they're talking about. Well, look, I'm it, saying the group of it, people who are being dumb about this is bigger than usual. If okay. you if you go on if you go on to 4chan for for any length of time, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know it, it, isn't that funny? So I've never done that. I don't even really know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, just keep, keep going, keep going. Yeah, I mean, like if so, basically, like a lot of these right wing, like far far right wing sites, it's like the intersection of like where porn and political thought 
converge like it it's it's so messed up and so violent and i mean and and it's got it's it's literally got porn images with like racist jokes with you know plans for violence like all mixed in in the same <laughs> posts and stuff like that and it, it it will freak you out in pretty short order to be on there and i can see how people can can right. be following some of the trends, you know, in QAnon and places like that and and think, well, we got to yeah. put a lid on this. But you can't put a lid. That's the thing. You you put a lid on it and all people are going to see is that there's a unified front of very rich people, you know, who are not going to let them talk about stuff. And that, I, don't, I don't think that's going to go over well. I just, you know, I, I, what would be funny is if the uh, religious right got on board with this and it's like, well, OK, we'll let you do that if you also abolish pornography. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I wonder if they could that do would actually deal. be kind of that funny. I, I, I might, that I might tell you my top me into it. That, that would be just the, 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 the fiasco that would ensue. That would be hilarious. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> that would be like the eighties turned inside out. Yeah. It would be, right? it would be, it would be a hoot. Yeah. But here's the, the, here's the other thing that we were, you know, that we, we never, one of the, the consequences of, of these, these guys storming the Capitol, one of the consequences of this, this um, these guys attacking the Capitol is that it derailed all the other conversations that were happening. And the conversation that I was most interested in was the election. For God's sakes, that, that was that's the last time I saw you guys on election night. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the results, oh, yeah. the results weren't f fully known for quite a while after that. And the results are really interesting. So uh, Biden Super won, obviously, but but uh, but Trump was not repudiated in the way that everybody assumed he was going to be. He did quite well. He did better than people than every pollster said he was going to do. And there was that amazing shift of Latino voters in certain places and black men. Trump. Yes. And then there was the other shift. Uh, and none of this, I mean, because it's all been wiped out now, it's all forgotten already. And, and this is this is hugely important. And this is, uh, I think, probably more consequential in the long term than the capital, than the, you know, these these assholes storming the capital, uh, you know, because this is this is how politics this is how politics works. But it's already forgotten. But here's the 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 aspect of it that gets me. So when I talked to you guys last, I was in Johnson County, Kansas which is the wealthy uh, white collar suburbs of Kansas City, Missouri. And it's a sort of white flight suburb, you know, suburban area that was built largely in the 1950s, but it's still growing. It's, it's the, by far the richest county in Kansas. I think it has the most people of any county in Kansas. And uh, when I was a kid and we grew up in this little corner of it, that's very affluent, right? And I mean, very affluent. This is the ruling class of the city. These are the people mm. that own Kansas City. These are the people that own the state of Kansas. And uh, they were my neighbors when I was growing up. And I, you know, I wrote What's the Matter with Kansas is largely about these people because these are the most Republican people in America. Mm -hmm. Or they were, right? They had not voted for a they Democrat. They had not voted for a Democrat since Woodrow Wilson. It's the last time Johnson County went for a Democrat. And uh, when I was a kid, the Republican Party controlled every local office. They controlled, well, the governor of Kansas would would come from there, you know, and um, Biden just flipped it. And I went back and looked at the precinct. Biden won that area, the whole county. Right. And I went back and looked at the precinct uh, results for that little corner of it where I was speaking to you guys from. Biden won every single precinct. Wow. In that richest little neighborhood in 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 the state of Kansas, in the city of Kansas City, uh, it's a uh, it's yeah, it's incredible. So there's a there is a huge shift underway in this country. There is a coming together of elites that we've never seen before in our lives. And and you and you look at the and another thing that we're not that well we're allowed to talk about here. We are talking about it, but it got it got erased from the national conversation thanks to this idiot riot the uh, the the lout rampage and that is uh, the business community cutting off the republican party Where, did you see this yeah it's in, quite incredible well first if uh, you know the, the fundraising totals are finally in for 2020 and you biden massively outraised yeah biden outraised trump uh, and biden took the sort of uh, commanding heights industries the important industries of so silicon valley wall street 
<clears throat> Both went with Biden. Pharma. Trump, Trump, yeah, pharma. Trump got Trump took big oil. <laughs> right. Trump took uh, casinos, although that turns out it's just just a single guy, Sheldon Adelson. Right. And now Sheldon, he's dead. RIP, he died. RIP. Yeah. So and uh, yeah. And then and then as soon as that riot is over, the, the like Wall Street starts cutting off the Republican Party. All these other industries start cutting off the Republican Party. We are in the middle of an incredible like uh, a shift of the tectonic plates. It is happening before our eyes. Uh, this this uh, what do you call it? This gathering of the elites, you know, this consensus and they're gathering of the elites behind uh, uh, Biden, behind the Democrats. I don't know how long it'll last, but uh, this is uh, I've never seen this in my lifetime. You know, right. Right. But and then and then the question is, though, what does that mean going forward? Because the Republican Party, they, they have a couple of ways to go. They, they, they either can try somehow to wedge themselves back into legitimacy like with that crew but the other way is the josh Hawley way that they're already the workers flirting party with. Yep. right yeah and yeah. well what do, you, what do you think they're gonna do i mean i i don't know that they'll be competent in either direction so i i have no idea <laughs> but but cl- clearly the numbers would go the other way you know which well way? I, I it's it what do you think Katie? the numbers would, would go which way the populist way, the, su- the, the, popu- the pseudo populist, the pseudo populist the, way, seems feels yeah. like it's the only way they can go. That's yeah, certainly what, that's that certainly what wins elections. That's as they, as Trump taught them. Right. You know, look, look what he did. You know, in two, 2016, he, he beat Hillary Clinton, but he also won Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan. With half the money. Yeah, and uh, but he was so they the, the Republicans have to walk this very fine line. You know, they want to be the party of business, but they also want to reach out. Uh, to the sort of disgruntled, you know, white working class types and, and, and win those places. And if they can do both, then they dominate. But now it looks like they have to choose. Uh, and, I, you know, I've met a lot of Republicans here in Washington. It's kind of hard to imagine them not being the party of business. I mean, they're, they're, everything about them, it wouldn't it would cease to make sense. Right. You know what what I mean? does I mean, that they, look like? They, does that just look like socially reactionary policies? Because because aren't right wing populists, which, as you've pointed out and written about, that's not a real thing. It's like a invert. A, a right. it's, it's, a, it's a phony. It's a, it's an act, a phony yeah. thing. But they don't believe in the labor movement. Right. So they're right. Just, of course, what, they just of want. course, they hate them. So, like, what is that even what does their thing even look like? What does their economic program even look like? What would it look like? Well, it's not about economics. It's about messaging. It's about, you know, like, you know, Reagan's patriotism. You go a military buildup. Right is is one way to be can I can I can I can I, can I can I drop some yeah. knowledge on you guys yeah. Sure, yeah. it's some kind of amusing knowledge so I'm reading this book right now this is John Meacham's biography of George Bush senior wow <laughs> I know like why great, why would I read yeah. that like yeah. what what the hell why would anybody read that well I'm reading it and uh uh so George Bush senior is like an American aristocrat you know, he comes from his dad was a senator. They come from and his grandfather was an investment banker and they go they can trace their ancestry. But way, way, way back. I mean, these are these are uh, as so like cave to, paintings in France. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These are as close to aristocrats as this nation yeah. produces. So in 1988, he's running for president. And he's faced with this guy, Michael Dukakis. And remember Dukakis, mm. he's like, he's like, he's like Little it's, not about, it's not about ideology, it's about competence. What's Bush's response? And, and by the way, Dukakis has this incredible bounce after their convention. He's like 18 points ahead. Okay, what does Bush do? How does, how does he challenge this guy? It's entirely culture wars. It's uh, prison Willie. furloughs, yeah. Willie Horton. Yeah. Uh, they they d- dug up this thing where um, where where Dukakis had said something mean about the Pledge of Allegiance. So they they would go around uh, pledging allegiance all the fucking time. Yeah. And and, and Bush would visit flag factories. And uh, Dukakis was proud so to be great. a member of the ACLU. Do you remember this? The car- <laughs> and his wife, and he said he wouldn't want yeah. the So they hammered him. Life. They hammered him for these things. It was entirely the culture wars. And I remember I was I was I just graduated from college that year and I was so angry about this campaign because it was so idiotic. And, and of course, Dukakis walked right into the buzzsaw. You know, he's like, it's with the, not with about, the, you know, with the um, tank. 
Well, no, I mean, just refuse. He wouldn't call himself a liberal. He wouldn't uh, you know, mobilize organized labor. He wouldn't reach out to traditional Democratic. He was he was a Clinton before Clintonism. He was a and, Clinton. What he was a Clinton without. So, yeah, without some, charisma, without, without, without street, without, street fighter uh, sense. Yeah. Exactly. Without any kind of smarts, without any kind yeah. of populist right. in, smarts. And yeah. and uh, yeah. Oh, my God. And Bush just crushed him. Mm. And the result was just devastating. Entirely done with culture wars and racial resentment. Yeah. Right. And oh, my God. And that's so they but they have that. They're very good at that. They can still play that game. But I well, don't know uh, if, if it works without the money behind them. You know, so they're in a real dilemma. These guys. I don't know. Well, I don't can, know what they do. They can run against wokeism. Yeah. No, that's true. That gives right. them a perfect target. You know, but, uh, but and and you know, there's a lot of things that could fall under that umbrella that would appeal to not just white people, also. Oh if, uh, no! Of course, they can still they can continue right. to build the sort of Trump coalition. There's no no doubt about that. But I'm asking you to imagine Republicans without money. It's it's right. almost hard to it's almost hard to to picture. I I, I you know it's like I, I grew up on things you know the Koch brothers and the Rockefellers and these are Republicans. Right. You know this is the people I grew up amongst. These are Republicans. The, you know this is the ruling class of America. You know what is going to happen now? Well, they're going to have to find they're going to have to find a, some sponsor that like oil and gas is now almost so is so disreputable that. It's out of the club of no for 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 like the corporate consensus, you know that maybe they'll be able to get money. But anyway, just just to switch gears quickly, what's what what are our expectations for a Biden presidency? Do they try to accomplish anything, or do they or or is this really going to be just a restoration of kind of the Pax Americana version of? Obama's presidency where expansionist military. Look, Biden's, you, you can say this, he's got his work cut out for him, right? COVID in the economy. And it's like, it's like if he delivers in the first hundred days, if he really steps up to the plate and gets half the country vaccinated in the first hundred days, this country will love that man. That's true. And if that he, is true. if he, if he like really does it with his stimulus package and he gets the economy roaring, this country will love that man. And uh, but what so, was the thing that we just learned today that I was saying, Matt, that the yeah, Democrats aren't going to deliver anything till March. They're not going to give him a COVID bill till March. Seriously? Yeah. That's that's madness. Well, he's I mean, gotta, they only, they only act, control both houses. On, so. I know, I know they he's got to act right. on this immediately. And the thing is, like, if he acts on it immediately, this country, I mean, they will they will worship him, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But uh, anyhow, we'll see. We'll see. That's what I think he should do. And if he does it, he, he will. You know, I don't know if he's even going to run again. He seems too old already, but yeah. uh, it, he'll he'll be a successful president. But the alternative is is Obama's third term, where he just sits around and says, "Oh, I can't do anything because those Republicans are so mean." You know, right. they right. keep outsmarting me all the time. They keep tricking me, and 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 you know, back to the disappointment of the Obama days. Right. But how can he say it this time when they won all this stuff? Like that's why I was so the. the the most exciting thing for me about Georgia wasn't that I have any expectation for the Dems. It's that they won't be able to blame everything on Republicans and they'll be exposed. Well, that that was the case last time around, too. And they still did that. I mean, that's remember uh, uh, it, when, in Obama's first couple of years, they had quite yeah, they had, a majority yeah. in both houses. Yeah. And uh, but they, they but they they refused to use uh, they refused to do away with the filibuster. So they tied they, they basically tied their own hands. And then Obama also. I mean, I liked him a lot back then, but let's be honest, he was fairly new to Washington. He'd only been a senator for two years before he became president. And so he was not really able to pull a kind of Lyndon Johnson, you know, where you get people to vote against vote for things that they are against. It's possible. Wait, but Thomas, you're the one who taught me that he didn't want those things. That's yeah, that's thing right. No, that's exactly political. exactly. So that's it's not that he's that's ultimately no, by, the, by the end. There are all sorts of things that Obama could have done without Congress. Uh, and and the 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 only answer, the answer that you have to, you know, conclude with by the end of his 
eight years is he just didn't want to do these things. You know, he just didn't want to. Uh, he didn't try it, because it, look, he's a smart man. He, he had Rahm Emanuel standing right next to him. He's one of the biggest assholes in all of Washington. And he oh, could have said, true. you know, Rom, go down there and pull a Lyndon Johnson and get this shit done. He right. never, he never did that. it. And he had Eric Holder right there. He could have said to Eric Holder, you know, prosecute these Wall Street guys. We're right. going to make a big stink out of this. You know, Rom would have resigned before doing that, though. Before getting tough with the uh, conservatives or the, the, Rom, the blue yeah. dogs or whatever. Maybe. But, you know, he works for the president. So find another ROM. This is the, the, the lack of imagination of these people is always so when you compare it to the Republicans historically. The, I mean, not Trump here. Trump is just a fucking idiot. <laughs> but when you compare it to Republicans historically, these guys are incredibly resourceful, innovative, dynamic, you know, coming up with new ideas, dreaming like like the, the, uh, that story I told about George Bush, you know, figuring out how to beat Dukakis. It's like, let's just talk about Willie Horton constantly. <laughs> Right, know? and this is uh, the guy who did dream this up was his character called Lee Atwater, who is uh, this classic Republican, you know, um, a moral character, yeah, evil, evil genius. They've they got a whole string of these Carl Rove, Carl uh, Rove, Steve, yeah. Steve Bannon. You know, they've got a whole string of these guys, and they're they're very very good at the game. And the Democratic version is like Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> you know, yeah, who, who, who will not get tough with uh, with the people he needs to get tough with. He gets tough with like you know the Chicago Teachers Union, <laughs> right. Right. Or, right, or right. Um, you know, black people. Uh, yeah, shot. yeah. Covering up, covering up the uh, murder, police murder of that kid. Uh, okay. La Donald, yeah. la last question I have for, for 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 both of you. Like, one of the things that I that is amazed me about how I felt this morning was how glad I am that this is going to be over. Like, there's there was no entertainment value in the Trump era. For most of it, I, I, I felt. And there was an element to the way he was covered that like always like really bothered me. There was like a glee about it that that yeah. was just so off putting. Um, and I, it, I constantly beating up the stupid kid. You know, it's like it's like these it's like these guys from CNN. For the like, wrong things. Uh, look, I, I, the wrong I, things. That was I tricked I tricked the dummy. Look, I tricked the dummy again. Look, 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 look. He fell for it again. But look at this. There was just this intensity of like uh, 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 of, you know, self-congratulation about how much we were how much more right we were than this guy. And and it was like a mandatory tone yes, to yes. everything. And, I and hated it, that. I hated you know, that. And that's and that's when when we go to write the history of these policy. years. When we go to write the history of these years, uh, will we reckon with that 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 an, the anti-Trump attitude, which is 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 loathsome in its own way, exactly why like the way you described it. Yeah, and it's I mean, gone it's, now. And but it's it's not. No, that attitude is going. Trump is gone. Trump is gone. Right. But that yeah, attitude, that attitude is still with us and will be with us. And this, I, this is where we started the show. I guess but towards so. whom? Well, towards they'll find, they'll find, like, who, they'll who find somebody. To, the maybe yeah. towards maybe towards you guys. That's true. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're gonna start looking around. And, <laughs> back. and this is our periodical reminder. Periodic reminder that we don't like Trump, and uh, there's a lot to go after him for. It just again trying to pull out of Syria or. Uh, trying to de-escalate things, you know, again, the, but, the but people how hard did it really try? Trump, hey, you he didn't, you he didn't even know what he was doing. He no, did. but, but it was always, it, it was, yeah. But like, for instance, the whole, and I say this a lot, but the narrative that he is a Cheeto Mussolini unprecedented threat who should have ratcheted things up with Putin was so stupid. It, it was and just, find so much it was of the relentless. Resistance. Yeah. You know what I mean? but, but he had, he had so, I mean, so many opportunities to be that, to be, to, you know, to be a strong man, to be an authoritarian. And he didn't take them. I mean, the most perfect one, of course, was COVID. I mean, this country was screaming for him to take charge and show some leadership. And he did, he did nothing. And, and in fact, oh, yes. since the election, I don't think he's even mentioned it. All he's talked about since the election is how he was cheated. He's yeah. just like, this man's, his, his brain doesn't work right, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Like, Actually, Tom, Tom, he's a genius. Oh, is that what it is? What did he say about himself? He's a what genius? Very, a very, very stable genius. 
Very God. stable genius. God. That should be a band. Can we form a band called that? <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, that kind of like mandatory, like get in line kind of a thing. Like it's, I, I feel like it is gone. Like for, uh, I don't feel that same kind of thing today. Although maybe they'll find some other way to impose oh, I'm, it. I'm immensely relieved uh, that, that, that he's gone and, and that yeah. Biden is in there. But, but then I thought about it and it's like, Trump was great copy. I mean, not just for the anti-Trump people that you described, but uh, I, you know, I had a lot of fun with them too, uh, with the situation that he set up. I mean, think about everything we've been describing here. He ushered us into a new and really interesting era. And I don't know how we're going to come out of it, of course, but like the craziest things have been happening the last four years. Yeah, but that was only if you were allowed to explore all the angles to right. Trump. No, that's because... right. And, and, and I write for foreign publications. So. Right, exactly. What does that tell <laughs> you? And MSNBC won't have you on anymore, right? It used to be regular well, they, there. They, I, they, 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 I, I don't know what happened. They lost my they lost my phone number. I, I, I guess they thought my pundit card got canceled. And I guess my right. pundit card did get canceled. Well, no, you were critical but, of the Dems and not just the Republicans. So they right, know right. you. And they don't, want, they don't want to hear that, which is which is totally weird. So we're we're all agreed though today a net plus, right? For yeah, sure. but I want to issue a warning that all we're, we're going to see a lot of wolf washing. What is that? Oh uh, well, yeah, there's wolf gonna washing. Be a lot Whenever of that. Yeah. someone is terrible, is a point they're going to hide behind the diversity so that we have like no, no. The word for that is the word for that is Clintonism. <laughs> it is. I'm serious. Go back and look yeah. at Chris Christopher Hitchens' book about Bill Clinton. It's called "No One Left to Lie To," and it's right. the first time the first time that anybody wrote about this. And he said, with Bill Clinton, he has these all these reactionary or, or conservative ideas. And I forget how Hitchens put it, but he said that he 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 muscles them through with a you know like a, a, a bodyguard politics. bodyguard of political correctness or yeah. you know what uh, something like that yeah. and uh, I, I forget how hitchens was was great when he was go to words yeah no but woke washing is an important term i think i mean i did that's kind okay, of so no you're right that's that's with. actually best better than clintonism but well it's a it's we're gonna you know there's white obviously there's green washing pink washing right which is when israel hides like you know uh hides their crimes against palestinians by pointing to how much they love lgbtq people um, and so this is like we saw this example with Jonathan Martin, a New York Times journalist who when um, when Cedric Richmond was named to some weird new made up position, which turns out, by the way, is basically a position to build uh, outreach to conservative white people. Anyway, Cedric Richmond is a black former congressman, terrible on on energy. And when he was named um, for this new for Biden's administration, the Sunrise Movement spoke out against it. And Jonathan Martin tweeted from the get go, from the beginning, um, people are going after Biden's most influential black staffer, which is exactly what's going to happen every time someone's criticized. Mm -hmm. Just watch. It's going to be framed as racist, what, uh, sexist, no, anti-gay. Were, were you guys at this at the at the 2016 conventions by any chance? The Democratic one? I was. Yes. Do you I remember was, yeah. that moment where the Marine general came out on stage and uh, gave that really kind of bloodthirsty speech. Do you remember that? And there was a gasp. There was an audible gasp in the auditorium. And then they pulled back the curtain and he had a unit of soldiers with him. He had a, like a platoon of soldiers with him. And they were, you know, the rain, it was a rainbow coalition. They were from every, um, you know, visibly different background. And um, that was the first time I ever thought of this, that this, this ideology that you're describing, Katie, could be the rationale for empire. You could do it. You could oh, totally a way is. of, of like co conquering the world and saying you're doing it. For, yeah, <laughs> you're doing it for well, like yeah, you know yeah exactly well, for you know well, imperialism. Yeah. Yes, well, it, it could happen. It's really disturbing. Yeah. Because the previous yeah, incarnation was remember remember Thomas Friedman's golden straitjacket idea. Yes, like we're, that's we're right. Do, the we're, market. We're doing, we're doing it for the market. We're forcing wealth on you. Yes, but now and we're going to force his model was his model was Singapore. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Now Singapore has a really interesting. Here we're coming full circle. Singapore has a really interesting. You know, there's a lot of censorship in Singapore, but it's not direct overt censorship. What they do is they have a really they do like what Trump wanted to do. They'd opened up their libel laws, mm -hmm. so if you insult a politician in Singapore, he can sue you. So mm -hmm. any kind of political speech is inherently um, you know, problematic. You, and so they constantly, any opposition politician that rises up, they sue them into bankruptcy. 
and they take like uh, any newspaper like so that like, i used to write for the wall street journal wall street journal is um it's not banned in singapore what they do is they limit their circulation so they can only have like 500 copies on the island wow of each yeah Doesn't something so like bad. nuts like that yeah and that's that that's the model it's a very um modern day model for censorship it's very clever yeah well that's yeah. that's what I, that's what went through my mind with all this sedition stuff is it, it's going to become a, a a way to to uh you know artificially reduce certain kinds of media speech too right because people they're, they're going to yeah. expand the, the the definition of that to but that wouldn't be private what you're talking about. This is going to be a highly weird period of our history. And I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I was turning around, by the way, if you saw me turn around. That was because I was looking for my copy of The People Know. But guys, if you're watching this or listening to this, stop what you're doing and order a copy of The People Know, uh, History of Antipopulism. So here it is. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm rewriting good. it, rewriting it right now with one of my. With Maybe you my, should call it The People Yo. Yeah. The what people up, people? Yo. Yeah. The People Yo. <laughs> listen, listen up, liberal. Yeah. <laughs> up, you no, got just call it Trump is an existential threat. Just call it that. And then yeah, there you go. Like and people are reading it that, well, yeah. actually, I don't know about that. Did you see I saw one of the funniest things I've seen on Twitter recently was somebody took a photo in a in a, a bookstore, you know, a, a, a real bookstore, not Amazon. Yes. It was, it was a remainder table. All these books about Trump. Trump. I know. <laughs> that, is oh, that was rich. That was great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. Pr proof of conspiracy, proof of whatever. But Matt, yeah. didn't, yeah. wait, didn't you write one right at the start? Didn't you write a, a book about Trump? I did. It was a bestseller, yeah. Insane Before Clown President. Yeah. Well, look, uh, today was, it was crazy in the, e in the end of a, I would say, a, a really poor four-year experience. So <laughs> I'm glad to all be, to be sharing, sharing, commemorating all that with both of you. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and how I about, think, wait, how about Pence rising to the occasion? Did you see that? Pence, he, he did. Pence was, uh, you rising know, from the ashes like a fly. Yeah. <laughs> rising from shit. Right now, I'm going to go in the other room and I have a bottle of Rioja and I am going to consume it. Excellent. Um, because there's no parties for, you know, here in Washington, no great parties to go to uh, for Biden's inauguration. Ordinarily, they'd be also you'd have your choice. Right. There'd be all sorts of wonderful things going on. But just go find the... where Hunter Biden is and, you know, bring, yeah, that's where the party is. And bring, mask up. Mask, bring triple mask five hundred dollar bills, you know, yeah. and uh, you'll be you'll be all right. He'll, he'll hook yeah. you up. Uh, all right. Well, this was awesome. Yeah, uh, thank thank you. you, Thomas Frank, uh, Kate, uh, Katie. Uh, this was fun, right? All right. That was awesome. We're happier yeah. than we were a day ago. So yeah. um, and then uh, but it's probably all going to be downhill from here. But we'll, we'll yeah. be there to tell you <laughs> all and about subscribe, it. So. Subscribe to Useful Idiots. Uh, hit subscribe and then hit the bell. Uh, rate and review us on uh, wherever you listen to us and uh, never, ever listen to or watch uh, Positive yeah. America. Vomit uncontrollably instead. If you're thinking about yeah. doing that. And uh, and thank you, Thomas Frank, to, for joining hey, us. Hey, this was a blast, yes. guys. All right. Take care. And we'll see you all next week. All right. So long. Bye.